Gray to lose to her seat. Um, she has an interesting and amazing story to tell you. Uh, she's a motivational speaker, she's an author. Carol's traveled here to Pauline County to tell her story to you. Let's welcome Ms. Carol Hart. Thank you. Good afternoon, students, teachers, and honored guests. I'm here today because I was the victim of a drunk driver. I was on my way to work at 8 o'clock in the morning when a drunk driver crossed the center line and hit me head on. In the 100 mile per hour impact, my face was ripped apart from my skull and my facial bones were crushed to powder. The doctor told my husband to plan for my funeral. I wouldn't live through the night. I survived, but I am one of the fortunate ones. Most victims of drunk driving crashes don't live to tell their story. That's why I'm so passionate about being here today to share my story with you. I don't want what happened to me to happen to any of you or your loved ones. Now the man that hit me that morning made a decision to get in his car and drive after he'd been drinking all night. That one bad choice has caused me a lifetime of pain. This man had three previous DUIs. He was driving without a license the morning he hit me and he had four previous DUI crashes before he hit me. He had a .22 blood alcohol content. That's almost three times the normal limit. All it takes is three seconds of either your eyes or your mind off the road to have a fatal crash. Now that goes for texting, or any type of distracted driving, like eating or even drinking a soft drink. Three seconds is not very long. Is it worth it to send a quick text if it means losing your life or killing someone else? Today I'm going to show you a PowerPoint presentation, pictures of me before my crash, pictures at the crash scene, and throughout my hospital stay. Now you know what they say about a picture. A picture's worth a thousand words. You might not remember any of the words I say today, but I hope you'll remember the pictures I'm gonna show you. Now, I got my first job at the Sheridan Park Hotel in Washington, D.C. As a public relations assistant, I went to every event at the hotel. Now the Sheridan Park Hotel was the second largest hotel in DC at the time. So that means that I had to go to the inaugural ball, the symphony ball, all the congressional receptions. Every week I had congressmen, senators, sometimes uh, the president and the vice president would be coming to functions at the hotel. When I didn't get the promotion I wanted, I moved to Atlanta and I got a job as a sales manager. And as a sales manager, I had to have a good appearance as well. I had to go to all the events at night and during the day I had to go out and make sales calls. So having a nice appearance was an important part of both of the jobs. Then I met the man of my dreams and got married. This is me just before I got married. So I'm young, beautiful, I have a great job, my husband had a good job. I'll never forget that morning of the crash. It was actually a Saturday morning and my day off. I had plans to go to Lake Lanier with my husband and some friends. The phone rang that morning and it was my assistant. She said she was sick and could I work for her? Well, that was the last thing I wanted to do, is go into work that morning. But I told my husband I would go in. When I got off at 12 noon, I would meet him at the lake. So he said, fine. Now, just one week prior to this, 
I bought a brand new car. It was a BMW with alloy wheels and a sunroof. My dream car. Now I'd saved up for this car. Before I always had a used car, but you know how it is getting your first new car was really exciting. So I got in my new car that morning and drove off to work. The last thing I remember was taking a different way to work. Normally I took Georgia 400, but that particular morning there wasn't much traffic, so I went down Roswell Road. Also that morning, a nurse from Northside Hospital, she was getting off from the intensive care unit and she took a different way home. She followed the drunk driver for two miles before he hit me. He was weaving back and forth over the center line. He was so drunk, he didn't know he was on the wrong side of the road. She kept blowing her horn trying to get him to pull over. He didn't even notice her. I came up over a hill. I never saw the drunk driver. Next thing I know is just what the doctors told me and what my family told me. I have no memory from this point. This nurse rushes to my aid. She wasn't able to get me out of the car on the driver's side. She had to go around to the passenger side and she and a truck driver stopped. The two of them dragged me out of the car and put me down in the road. This nurse checked for a pulse. I had no pulse. I was not breathing. I was bleeding from my mouth, my ears, my nose. This nurse quickly cleared the blood out of my mouth, resuscitated me, and called an ambulance. I was taken to Northside Hospital. And this nurse was my nurse during my intensive care stay at Northside. Now it's hard to believe that this is my brand new BMW. Now it's interesting to note that the BMW, the design, the engine dropped on impact. If I, if I had been in my other car, the engine would have crushed me. So the engine dropped and you can see how the hood just came back in an accordion fashion. It's just a miracle that I survived. Now, there were no airbags at the time, so the steering wheel hit my face, and that's what caused my facial injuries. My nose was broken. My jaw was broken in three places. I had a broken pelvis. But the worst was the traumatic brain injury that put me in critical condition. My husband was called to the hospital and he was taken into a small room and told of my injuries. They at first thought I was blind. They told my husband, I think your wife is blind. Her eyes do not react to light. Well, my husband was devastated. Can you imagine your family, what they would feel? My husband said he was prepared for what I looked like. But when he walked into that intensive care room and took one look at me, he said it looked like somebody took a baseball bat and just bashed in my face. My head was swollen to twice its normal size. I was black and blue and unrecognizable. He said to the doctor, that's not my wife. And then the doctor gave him my wedding rings. And my husband just broke down and cried. My mom said the only thing she recognized were my hands, that I was totally unrecognizable. My mom also said that it was like losing a child. Hearing the words from the doctor, plan for your daughter's funeral, she's not going to live through the night. So my family had a really tough time dealing with it. The doctors wouldn't let any pictures be taken when I was in a coma. I was in a coma for four days. And again, the doctor said, you don't take pictures of a dying woman. 
this woman is not going to live. And that's what the doctors kept telling my family. So my family was praying around the clock. Then finally, day five, I came out of my coma and the first picture was taken of me. Very first picture on day five. Now my sister said, you look good in this picture. This is me, most of the swelling had gone down. So this is when I look good. So it's very difficult on my family. So as soon as I came out of my coma, the very first surgery they did was to pick the tiny bone fragments out of my face in a six hour surgery. Can you imagine six hours? They took four steps and picked all the tiny bone fragments one by one out of my skin. Then they had to wire my face back to my skull. It was a very tedious surgery. So I had a tracheotomy. They cut a hole in my trachea so I would be able to breathe during the surgery. And when I woke up, I wasn't able to talk. When you have a tracheotomy, you're not able to speak. The hole has to heal up before you can talk. They gave me pencil and paper, and I said, I'm in pain, I need to be in the hospital. I was in total shock. I didn't know I was in the hospital. Now it's been over 30 years. I still have a scar where the tracheotomy was. But I had bruises and cuts all over my body. And then they had to wire my mouth shut. And with my mouth wired shut in the hospital, they fed me intravenously. But when I got home and looked in the mirror for the first time, I saw a face that was not my own. Can you imagine looking at yourself and seeing someone and it's not your face? At that moment, I wished I'd have died in the crash. I didn't want to live. It was horrible. I'd write in my diaries, I'm ugly, I hate myself. I had the lowest self-esteem you can imagine. Well, because my mouth was wired shut, I just had to inhale soup through my wired mouth. I had to take a spoon and just suck soup through my wired mouth. Now, that couldn't have any noodle soup or vegetable soup, just clear liquid broth for three months. It was devastating. Again, I would write in my diaries, I don't want to live. What do I have to live for? Now, I wonder if I could get a volunteer from the audience just to come up and do something simple. Do we have any brave souls? Raise your hand. Okay, this girl here. It's not going to be hard. You're just going to follow my instructions. What is your name? Caleb. Okay, now I just want you to grit your teeth together, turn and face your students, okay? And repeat after me. This is what I would sound like. What? This is what I would sound like. Just say that. This is what I would sound like. With my mouth wired shut. With my mouth wired shut? See, that's pretty difficult, isn't it? No. Now, tell me what your favorite foods are to eat. Bread. Bread. Oh, how about that? Well, you wouldn't be eating any bread. Okay, what else? Soup. Well, soup. You could suck in some soup, but okay, you can be dismissed. Okay, give a round of applause for our volunteers. Okay, the next hardest thing for me was losing the sight in my left eye. I lost the sight in my left eye. Even though the doctors thought at first I would totally be blind, I did lose my eyesight, so it was very difficult for me. Now, if I could have somebody that plays sports and that's a brave volunteer, raise your hand if you play sports and you're a brave soul that want to, want to come up here. Okay, brave souls. Nobody? Come on down. <laughs> you know, this guy's been volunteered for. Okay. <laughs> okay. Come on down. All righty. 
So I see your friends have volunteered you. What is your name? Uh, Cameron. Okay, Cameron. Do you play basketball, I guess? Okay. Famous basketball star. Okay. I want you to put your left hand over your left eye. Put your left hand over your left eye. Now walk around and see how that feels for you. Walk around. Okay, Cameron, do you think you'd be able to shoot some hoops having half your sight gone? Be a little difficult. Now, how old are you? Uh, 15. 15. Uh, do you drive yet? No. What about driving? What if you were on 285.75 and you had half your vision gone? How do you think you'd handle it? Wouldn't be good. Okay, round of applause for our brave volunteer. <laughs> Okay, we had a volunteer, but his friends had to kind of push him a little bit. Now, finally, the doctor told me to come to his office after two months of having my mouth wired shut. The doctor said, well, I think you'll be able to eat some soft foods. Come to my office and I'll take the wires off. So I went to the office that day and he took off the wires and he said, okay, open your mouth. Well, I tried to open my mouth and it would not open. My mouth would not open. And then the doctor came and took both of his hands and tried to pry open my mouth. It still wouldn't open. Can you imagine? And then he says, it's worse than I thought. I guess you'll have to go back to eating soup. And I said, no. So another month of eating soup and finally three months three months of sucking soup, I finally was able to open my mouth just to eat soft foods like scrambled eggs. Here's a picture of me stuffing scrambled eggs in this little tiny slit. I could only open my mouth like a half an inch. Sometimes I'd have to put a mirror on the table and just look where the little hole was so I could stuff the food, the scrambled eggs in my mouth. I dropped down to 89 pounds. I was skin and bones, none of my clothes fit. I'd write in my diaries, I'm ugly, I hate myself, I don't want to live. It was just really a horrible time because one man's bad choice to drink and drive. Just one bad choice and I'm having to deal with all this. Now I had five more surgeries to rebuild my face. Five, and I never looked the same after five more surgeries. They took pieces of Teflon to put where my cheekbones were blown away. They took cartilage from behind my ear to fill in where my eyes were knocked out of their sockets. Surgery after surgery, I thought I'd be back to that beautiful young woman again, but it didn't happen. Then they took a piece of hip bone. They had to carve out a piece of my hip bone to build me a nose. And then I had pain in my hip and in my nose. I had more swelling, more bruising after each surgery. I was in more pain because of one man's bad choice to drink and drive. Then tears would just flow down my left cheek. And they said I had a damaged tear duct, so I had to go and have my tear duct replaced. Then one year later, I had a damaged tear duct on the other cheek and had that replaced as well. Now you can see in this picture before and after. Before the crash, I had long almond-shaped eyes. People always used to compliment me on my beautiful eyes. Then after the crash, I have deep set eyes. The way I knew they were so deep set, I tried to curl my eyelashes with an eyelash curler. I could not reach my eyelashes. Can you imagine? The eyelash curler would not reach my eyelashes because my eyes were so knocked back in my head. It was terrible. I have a different nose, a different shaped face, and then as soon as my mouth was unwired, I had to wear braces for three long years. Raise your hand if any of you have had to wear braces. Yeah, no fun, but I tell you what, it wasn't as bad as having your mouth wired shut. 
that was just horrible. So the doctor told me that I would never work again because of my traumatic brain injury that I could never work. I could never have a job like I had in Washington or a sales position job. And another doctor told me because of my broken pelvis, I would never have children. But God did bless me with a daughter. I had little Krista and she kept me going. Having a reason to get up, a reason to live. Now my husband and I did get a divorce. He cheated on me, he wasn't there for me. And we did end up getting a divorce. But I finally raised my little daughter, Krista, and when she graduated from Pope High School in Marietta, I really started doing some soul searching to find out, you know, I knew God saved my life for a reason and I would just couldn't figure it out. So I heard that Mothers Against Drunk Driving had a victim impact panel where victims told their story and I so wanted to speak, but there was one problem. I was a nervous speaker. I couldn't even get up and speak to a few people. So I joined Toastmasters at the square. Raise your hand if you've heard of Toastmasters. A few of you. Toastmasters is a public speaking group where you learn to get over your fear and learn to speak. So after joining Toastmasters, I was able to join the Victim Impact Panel for MAD. Now I am a Victim Impact uh, speaker. And the one thing I learned after joining MAD is I learned to call myself a survivor. I wasn't a victim anymore. I'm now a survivor. So I call myself a survivor. And every time I speak at MAD, I have convicted drunk drivers come up to me and thank me for sharing their story, sharing my story with them. And so it's very rewarding to be able to do this. When people would hear my story, they said, you have an amazing story, you should write a book. Well, I never thought I could write a book, but I did take the diaries I had through my three years of recovery, and I wrote a book of face value based on my true story. And now I'm inspiring people all over the world. I get emails from people from Germany, the United Arab Emirates, all over. And I'm just amazed that people are being inspired by my story. Now this is a picture of me at the Barnes and Noble in West Cobb. And it was just an amazing presentation I gave and I spoke. Now this is a picture of my daughter Krista, all grown up. This is the mad vigil. Every year, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, they have a vigil to honor all of those victims killed needlessly by a drunk driver. This picture was so big, I couldn't get all the people on there. There were so many. Now, I also volunteer at the Mad Walk and other Mad groups as well. Now, my daughter Krista got married in 2010. And in 2014, she had my granddaughter, Lila Carroll. So when Lila was born, I really started searching for the nurse that saved my life. And I would ask, every time I spoke, if anybody knows the nurse, Debbie Leslie, the nurse that saved my life and that worked at Northside Hospital, you know, please let me know. And then, a year and a half ago, I got an anonymous email from someone and they said, I found the nurse that saved your life. And I was so excited I got an opportunity to meet her. I just want to comment on my daughter, Krista. She looks so much like I did before the crash. She has the long almond-shaped eyes and the oval face like I used to have. So this is Debbie Leslie, the nurse that saved my life. I was able to meet her. It was so exciting to be able to thank her in person for not only saving my life, but also because she saved my life, that I now have a daughter and a granddaughter. Now I want to tell you a little bit of what I learned through all this. Now if you would have asked me before my crash if I had healthy self-esteem, I would have said, sure, of course I did. 
but I didn't. I thought I did. Self-esteem is how you feel about yourself. Self-image is how you see yourself. So it's possible to have a good self-image, you like what you see, but still have low self-esteem. That was me. Now my father was verbally abusive, so growing up I had a bad childhood, so I had this low self-esteem for a very long time, but I masked it. I totally masked it with, oh, I'm fine, I have a good self-image, but it didn't work. Once I started to look inside, I realized how low my self-esteem was. If you're one of the ones that has low self-esteem, you're not alone. 85% of people have low self-esteem. So I want you to just take a moment and I want you to rate your self-esteem. One being the very lowest and 10 being the highest. You think highly of yourself, you have low self-esteem. Take two or three seconds and just on your mental blackboard, rate your self-esteem. Okay, go. Okay, excellent. Now, also, I found, students, I found some ways to raise my self-esteem and I want to share that with you, okay? First of all, you don't want to build your self-esteem on your beautiful face or your handsome face or whatever. You want to look inside. Self-esteem comes from within. Second, you need to love and respect yourself. If you don't have a healthy self-love, no one can love you. Then you have to focus on your good traits. Focus on your good traits, not your bad. I know I was guilty of that. I was focusing on the nose that I didn't like, my deep set eyes. That did not serve me well. So focus on the good traits. I want you just to take a few minutes and focus on one of your good traits. Take two or three seconds and think about one of your good traits. Now, don't compare yourself to others. How many times do we compare ourselves to others? I know I have compared myself to others. I compared myself to the old Carol, wishing that I was like she was. Now, another thing that helps your self-esteem is smiling. Smiling raises your self-esteem. Something as simple as smiling. When you smile, you send out endorphins and people catch them and smile back. So I want you to take a few seconds, turn to the person on your left and just smile. If there's no one on your left, just smile. Okay, great. Now, no talking. Turn to the person on your right and just smile. Just smile. Excellent. Okay. Now, next. No talking. Students. You are a unique individual. Focus on what you have that no one else has. Focus on what you have. Now, resentments and baggage. We all have resentments and baggage. I know I did. I resented the drunk driver that hit me. I resented my ex-husband who cheated on me. But once I learned to forgive these individuals, I had the most amazing peace. So I want you to take a few seconds. Think of somebody that wronged you, somebody that did you wrong, and bring that person to mind and say, I forgive, and whatever the, the offense they did, I forgive the person's name and what they did to you, right now. Okay, and then you release it and let it go. Now, see the positive, not the negative, and everything that happens to you. For so long, I saw only the negative. Once I started looking at the positive, that's when my emotional healing began. Now, exercise. When you exercise, it raises your serotonin level. That happy hormone, you feel good about yourself, and it also raises your self-esteem. 
And the last thing is purpose. Finding your purpose. If you find a purpose that benefits others, that not only helps your self-esteem, it helps your self-esteem as well as others. So purpose is something that lives on long after you're gone. Something like a book for generations will enjoy your book. It's not something like just a regular job. Now overcoming adversity. Now I've come through a lot of adversity and there's three things that I learned I want to share with you. The first thing about adversity is you have to take your focus off the problem or whatever the adversity is. For so long I talked about my crash and it did not serve me well. So take your focus off the problem. Then the second thing is learn from it. There's a lesson to be learned in every adversity. The greatest lesson I learned was I learned to see my inner beauty. The third thing about adversity is to help others, to find a way to help others through what you've been through. So I was able to help others through my books and my speaking. Now when I think about overcoming adversity and other people that have overcome adversity, first person that comes to mind is Colonel Sanders. Now raise your hand if you know Colonel Sanders. Yeah, these people. Okay, raise your hand if you have ever eaten Kentucky Fried Chicken. All right, everybody. Well, Colonel Sanders, Colonel Sanders, there's the backstory. Colonel Sanders was 65 years old when he got his first Social Security check. And he said, I can't live off this. What else can I do to make money? So the only thing he had was a chicken recipe that everybody loved. And he thought, well, I don't want any money up front, but I'll just find somebody to partner with me. He was turned down a thousand and nine times before he sold his Kentucky Fried Chicken recipe. Can you imagine? He was one persistent guy. He turned down all of those times. But he kept going, and now the rest is history. There are Kentucky Fried Chicken franchises all over the world because one man didn't give up. Now, how many of you know Tom Monaghan? Raise your hand. Nobody? How many of you have eaten Domino's Pizza? Raise your hand. Okay, well, Tom Monaghan founded Domino's Pizza, but he had some adversity in his life. Everything was going well, and then the pizza parlor burned down, and he thought, what can I do? I can't have the people come to me and eat pizza. And then he thought of pizza delivery. That one pizza delivery idea made Tom Monahan a wealthy man. But he didn't give up in the face of adversity. Now my favorite man about adversity is Walt Disney. Walt Disney had a lot of adversity. <laughs> Next. Walt Disney had a lot of adversity. And uh, he started out, his father told him, when he was drawing pictures as a little boy, his father said, Walt, quit drawing the stupid pictures. He didn't encourage him. And then his teacher told him, Walt, flowers don't have faces. Draw something realistic. He got no encouragement. So then Walt got his dream job as a cartoonist for a newspaper. And he was so happy. But then he got fired for lack of creativity. So when he got fired, he got him a studio in a bad part of town. It was kind of mice infested, but Walt believed in himself. And one day he was drawing and a little mouse came out and was running around. Walt Disney drew that mouse with big ears. That day, Mickey Mouse was born. If Walt Disney had not been fired, we wouldn't have Disneyland, Disney World, any of the Disney characters. Walt Disney was a man that overcame some tough adversity. You're probably thinking, all oh, these are old, old guys, right? <laughs> so I'll talk about somebody a little younger. How many of you know Evan Spiegel? Nobody? <laughs> How many of you use Snapchat? Okay, most everybody. 
Well, Evan Spiegel created Snapchat, but guess what? He wasn't successful right off the bat. He named it Peekaboo, and it was a total flop. All his friends said, that's stupid, it'll never work. Everybody told him, give it up, it's stupid. But Evan believed in himself, he kept going. And now, this Evan Spiegel, he's 25 years old, and he's worth $2.1 billion with a B. That's because Evan didn't give up in the face of adversity. Next. He didn't give up. Soar like the eagle. I really love this because did you know the eagle only soars because of the resistance to the wind. It's only the resistance to the wind that causes the eagle to soar. Just like adversity. Adversity can sometimes catapult you to your destiny. That really excites me that all this adversity can be just the wind to push you to your final destination, to whatever your destiny is. And, and that really excites me. Next. Now there's some roadblocks to success and I just want to go through these quickly. And these are the things that I experience. Procrastination, people pleaser, and perfectionist. You know, when I wanted to be a speaker, and I thought, well, I have a traumatic brain injury. I don't know if I can remember all this speaking. That's probably the last thing I need to do. And then well-meaning friends said, oh, well, if you have a brain injury, that's probably not something you want to do. And then being a perfectionist, waiting till the perfect time where everything's lined up. Well, you can't wait for everything to be perfect. You've got to do like the Nike commercial said and just do it. You just have to get out there and do it. Next. So I had a plan to join Toastmasters. And then you've got to have the passion. You've got to be passionate about what you're doing. And then persistence. You've got to be like Colonel Sanders, that you're not going to stop no matter what. Now, the next thing that really helped me were positive affirmations. So I know it's time to stand up and stretch. Let's stand up and we're going to say some positive affirmations, students. Okay. Just repeat the words after me. Okay, students. All right, students. All right, just repeat these words. I am happy. I am worthy. I have healthy self-esteem. I am important. I have God-given gifts and talents. I can do anything. There are no limits except those I put on myself. I have a divine purpose. And I will fulfill it. That's a little wimpy. Let's try it again with a little more oomph. Come on, I am happy. I am worthy. I have healthy self-esteem. God-given gifts and talents. I can do anything. There are no limits. Except those I put on myself. I have a divine purpose. And I will fulfill it. I will leave a legacy for future generations. If you believe what you just said, say woohoo! All right, you can be seated. Okay, thank you, students. All right, all right, all right, students. Now I want you to go back to your imaginary blackboard where you rated your self-esteem. And now that you've done these exercises and you feel better, I know that I went to Illinois and I spoke at four schools and I had said this so many times that I was really 
high from all these words. It was great. So go back to your mental blackboard and give yourself a new number. Okay, everybody, back to your mental blackboard. Give yourself a new number after doing these exercises. Okay, three seconds. Now raise your hand if you had a higher number the second go around after doing. Excellent, okay, those of you that didn't, <laughs> Those of you that didn't, I need you to go to my website. Next. I need you to go to my website, Carol Harper Speak, and there is a download on there, 10 ways to raise your self-esteem. And I think it will really, really help you. Now I want to close with a story about a man in my Toastmaster club who gave a speech. And he started his speech with, where are the most speakers, authors, musicians, artists, entrepreneurs, where are they? And we all looked around and we said, we don't know. And he said, in the graveyard, so many people live and die with the book they never wrote, the product they never invented, the business they never started. Students, don't let that be you. Don't let one bad choice to drink and drive cut your life short. I read in the paper all the time, young 16, 17 year olds getting killed prematurely, never fulfilling their dream. And that is just such a sad, sad thing. But with all the adversity that I had, with having a blind eye and the traumatic brain injury and all that I did, think how much more you can do. Now, how many students are artists, love to draw, raise your hand, artists, great. Musicians, how many are musicians? Woohoo! How many want to write a book? How many writers? Okay, very good. So many talented people, parents, teachers, encourage your students. You don't want to be like Walt Disney's dad that didn't give him the encouragement he needed. My father never gave me the encouragement. But as for me, through all I've been through, if I can just save one life through what I went through, it would be worth all the pain and suffering I had to endure. Thank you, students. You've been a great audience. One more quick thing. I'm going to, I've, I've never done this before in any school, but I'm going to give away uh, a free copy of my book, A Face Value. And what I want you to do, if you've been touched in any way, you've been impacted with my talk today, I want you to go to my website, carolharperspeaks.com, and just send me an email, and then I'll have a drawing. You know, it might be two or three of you that were touched, but then your chances are better. Go to my website, just send me an email, and then I will bring the book over to your school and give it away to some lucky student. Y'all have a great afternoon and stay safe.